totally believe in what we're doing and I think it's the most important thing that I can be doing right now. There are so many people who are sick and if this can help them, people have to know about this. It's fantastic that I get to share this with my family, that we're doing this together and that we both feel so passionately about it. She was on over 40 different medicines. She had been on methotrexate um, and Plaquenil, one of those which nearly destroyed her vision. All of the potent anti-inflammatories, the Vioxx and the Celebrex, and was on all sorts of painkillers and all sorts of antibiotics. But she had classic steroid toxicity. Her face was in the shape of a moon because there's a lot of, of swelling that occurs in the face. At the age of 16, was diagnosed with a, a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and that evolved into a lupus condition, a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, an autoimmune disorder, and bedridden four years. Her mother thought she would never survive. I went to talk to William as a friend and as a doctor about his experience with patients and how they used cannabis. Seeing what the juicing did for me, using it in this form was so significant, it changed my life. About four to six weeks after I started on juicing every day, I had no more back pain, I didn't need pain pills, I felt the best I ever had. A lot of people think cannabis and pot are you know, not medicine. I had stumbled on an article in Scientific America in uh, December 2004. They had an article on marijuana as the brain's own marijuana. And they introduced the idea that the body produces uh, compounds that are very similar to those found in marijuana or cannabis. Cannabis actually goes upstream and provides feedback from the postsynaptic nerve to the presynaptic nerve, which was unheard of in neurochemistry. I mean, all neurotransmissions were unidirectional, and all of a sudden swinging against the force of that are those little cannabinoid molecules that tie the whole system together. The phytocannabinoids from this plant augment the body's attempt to restore and increase function to a normal level. So it mimics the regulatory system of cellular physiology. And recently, the Food and Drug Administration has approved of CBD, which is a cannabinoid like THC, one of 80 cannabinoids. The federal patent compares vitamin C, vitamin E, and CBD, or cannabidiol. CBD turns out to be more potent than either of those two. The thing that I warn my patients of is, if you're going to be juicing this flower and this leaf, and you're going to be doing this high-dose, non-psychoactive cannabinoid dietary approach, please do not heat it. When you heat cannabis, you make it psychoactive, which for a large part of the community, um, the psychoactivity of a plant is a measure of its medical quality. Um, but it's really quite the inverse. If you heat or age cannabis in any way, you're destroying some of the medicinal properties of it. To use the plant effectively, we have to use it the way it evolved over 34 million years, which is raw, because when it's raw, the THC is bound up as THC acid. It requires aging, drying, so as a hunter-gatherer, we gather this plant and we notice, wow, as this plant ages, it changes character and suddenly has a psychoactive effect. I think that's the most exciting area of cannabis research is looking at non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Because if you do heat it, you'll decarboxylic the THC acid, and you're gonna have 600 milligrams of THC acid with the CBD acid. You would be unconscious probably for the better part of the week. Between um, heating the plant, whether that's in a sucker, a cookie, a baked good, um, a butter, vaporized, smoked, all of those uh, techniques um, convert THC acid, which is non-psychoactive, into THC, and provide you with that 10 milligram dose. Um, but if you eat the plant raw, um, then THC acid is the way it's found in the plant. It's not psychoactive. The juicing allows you to get up to the 500 to 600 milligrams, which is 60 times more than you could tolerate if it was heated. This treatment is not psychoactive. People don't have to be stoned when they take it. They can take it and go to work. They can take it and play with their kids. It's hard for me to to understand laws against something like green leaf therapy and to think that prednisone is legal. We're still fighting the, the stigma of uh, marijuana back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. 
I was a prosecutor for eight years in Mendocino County, so I know it from both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor. The 1972 Controlled Substances Act said that marijuana has no medical value whatsoever. The federal government has a patent on its medical properties. The Food and Drug Administration has approved of it as investigative in the drug. I have not found the United States to be very open about cannabis research. In order to print an article in a peer-reviewed journal, you have to use cannabis that they have certified for your study. And there are physicians who have waited three, four, five, six years, some even longer than that, to just get a sample. The federal government's been kind of schizophrenic in the way it looks at marijuana. It says it has no medical value under that act, but at the same time, the federal government has been funding research in marijuana for years, for decades and they've even patented certain strains of marijuana because they recognize it has its that medical value. The California Narcotic Officers Association does not believe in medical marijuana. They believe it's all a big scam, and that's how they train law enforcement officers. Law enforcement is allowed to take a percentage of all assets that are forfeited and seized under the state and federal asset forfeiture law. So it takes the really enlightened and compassionate law enforcement officer to recognize that these medical marijuana laws are designed to protect patients. I was trained when someone had marijuana, you took them to jail. There wasn't a medicine use for, for marijuana. It's an illegal substance, and people went to jail for it. In 1996, California took a huge leap. Uh, I didn't support Proposition 215 because of the uh, education I had, the experience I had, and what I had seen through the illegal marijuana gardens that I had seen throughout my career. Since 1996, I have changed my opinion somewhat. I believe there is a very clear medicinal use for marijuana. That being said, I believe that there are a, a large percentage of people who use marijuana as an excuse to either make profits or for recreational. The, uh, the, the people who use marijuana for the true intended use that the voters pass, medicinal, I'll do everything I can to support their rights. There's many more things that law enforcement can be focused on than medicinal marijuana. And I, I don't want to give the impression at all that I support people who are growing marijuana for medical purposes 364 days of the year, and then one day a year they make 